So today we're going to be starting a short new series on a topic that can be pretty dark, pretty intense, but also deep and in a weird, holy way, kind of inspiring. Over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about martyrdom and look at the stories of a handful of Christian martyrs going all the way back to the birth of the church. Some of you might be asking, why are we talking about something so dark? Well, the world is a strange place, and people can be even stranger. When we look into the past, we see how brutal people can be to one another. We also see how Christians have suffered and persevered through it all. And although we live in a time and a place where Christians aren't experiencing persecution, I do think it's important for us to know how other folks have experienced things in the past, how some people in certain parts of the world are experiencing things now, and what might also reemerge at some point in the future. Because humans are humans, and sometimes they do human things, and history repeats itself. Now, if you've been in the church long enough, you've probably heard the phrase, the blood of the martyr is the seed of the church. This is actually a quote from a famous ancient Christian named Tertullian, And he lived from 155 to 210 AD. And just so you know how important this guy is to Christianity, this is the man who coined the term Trinity, which is how we talk about God being three distinct persons and one being. Now this quote is describing a weird phenomenon that Tertullian experienced in his day and age. Christians were being persecuted by their neighbors, by their government, by their culture, And as they were one by one being picked off, it seemed like more people were coming to know Jesus and to give their lives to him. In a weird way, the blood being poured out by these faithful men and women were encouraging others to one, take their faith more seriously themselves, and two, come and see what this whole Christianity thing was about because people are literally dying for it. And that's kind of the goal of this series. For those of us who are Christians, my hope is that hearing the stories of these martyrs will both encourage us because we see these people with such courage and bravery and resolve, but also challenge us to take our faith more seriously. And if you're watching and you're not a Christian, I'm hoping that you can come and see what so many people have been giving their lives for over the millennia. So the first person we're going to be looking at is someone you're probably familiar with. And if you've read any scripture in the New Testament at all, you've likely read some of his own work. We're talking about the Apostle Paul. Now, if you look at Christian art and uh, iconography from the Orthodox Church, you usually see Paul carrying either a book or scrolls. And that's because he's responsible for writing 13 out of the 27 books in the New Testament. But sometimes we see him with something else too, a sword. And it's believed that he's depicted with this sword because that's how he eventually died. According to church tradition, Paul was beheaded sometime in the mid-60s AD as a result of orders put out by the Roman Emperor Nero. But before any of that happened, and before Paul was even a follower of Jesus, he was a Pharisee named Saul. Now if you were watching our Jonah lessons, you might remember that a Pharisee is a particular type of Jew. They're a very pious sect of Jews. And they were the ones that knew their scriptures by heart. They were considered some of the holiest people. And they thought that the other people's unfaithfulness and misbehavior was the reason that God had not freed his people from the Roman Empire and made them their own whole kingdom again. In his letter to the church in Philippi, Paul talks about his pedigree as a rock star of a Jew. He says he was circumcised on the eighth day, which was a requirement for newborn males under the law. He was an Israelite hailing from the tribe of Benjamin that traces its way all the way back to one of Jacob's sons in the book of Exodus. Like we said, he was a Pharisee. He was blameless when it came to breaking God's law. And because he was zealous, he persecuted the church. In the book of Acts, we see that not only was Paul a master of his faith, But he also trained under one of the most respected and prestigious rabbis in Judea, a man named Gamaliel. 
And we also learn that he was a full Roman citizen, which is really important because that gives him so many other rights and privileges. He was so zealous for the Pharisee cause that he hated Christians, but he had a justified hatred in his eyes. He saw the Christians as heretics, as people who have turned from God and were leading other people astray with them. And because he was a Pharisee, he saw this as preventing God from liberating his people from their Roman oppressors. Early in the book of Acts, we see the first Christian to ever be martyred, a man named Stephen. He was preaching against the Jewish leaders who played a part in Jesus' death. He was speaking against the temple of Jerusalem. And he was also making everybody who was listening very angry. And they were so overcome with anger and zeal that they broke the law. They broke the Roman law that they were supposed to go through Rome if they wanted to execute somebody. And they killed this man by stoning him on the spot. And in Acts 7, 58, we learn that there was another young man present, a man named Saul. And he was overseeing this entire bloody act. And that is the very man who would later become Paul. Now, later in the book of Acts, Saul actually, of his own accord, goes to the chief priests and gets an official approval and license to go to a synagogue in Damascus and to clear it out of all the Christians there and bring them back to Jerusalem to be punished and possibly even executed. And he and his men were on the road traveling north when they had this wild encounter with the risen Jesus. He saw this light shine down on him from heaven and it was so intense that it brought him to his knees. Then him and his men heard the voice of someone saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And after he asked who it was that was speaking to him, the voice said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Then he told Saul to get up and rise and go into the city of Damascus. And from there he would be told what to do. And when he got up, he realized that he was blind, so he had to have his own men lead him into the city. For three days, this man sat in the city, and he couldn't see anything. And he was so shaken up by this whole encounter that he wasn't able to eat or drink at all. And I mean, think about this. Saul thought he was following God and doing what was right. But when he had this encounter and he realized that this Jesus was real, he was legit, it caused him to question everything he thought he knew about God and his faith in his entire life. Eventually, a man sent by God named Ananias came to see Saul. He laid his hands on Saul and he talked to him about what happened and what he was being called into. And then Paul regained his sight. And he was immediately baptized and he stayed with the Jesus followers whom he was actually intending on harming a few days earlier. Eventually, he left and spent 14 years unlearning what he thought was true and learning the actual truth about God. From there, he went up to the city of Jerusalem to see the other apostles, the disciples of Jesus. And he was given a mission to be an apostle to the Gentiles, to go and take the gospel to those who weren't Jewish. He started going by his Roman name, Paul, and went on many missionary journeys throughout the entire Roman world. He started churches in all these different cities and all these different places, and he wrote them letters to help instruct and correct them, which we have in our New Testament today. And all the while, he was dreaming of going to Rome so he could speak to Caesar about Jesus himself. Now, eventually, Paul was put in a situation where he could get what he actually desired there, while he was visiting the temple in Jerusalem, he was attacked by a group of Jews, and it was very similar to what he used to do to Christians himself back in the day. And when the Romans came, they broke up the brawl, they picked up Paul, and they brought him in for questioning. And in true Paul fashion, he shared his entire testimony with these soldiers. But they were not amused at all because all they wanted to know is why this group of people jumped him and were beating him. And after being passed from official to official, he finally invokes his right as a Roman citizen to appeal to Caesar, and things were set in place for him to be shipped to Rome. We don't know what happened to Paul after he got to Rome. We don't know if he ever got to talk to Caesar himself, but we do know he remained in prison. 
And at the end of Acts, we see him in Rome, in jail, preaching and teaching to anybody who would come and hear him. And we know that he even wrote some of his letters while he was in prison too. But it was here in Rome that eventually Paul would be martyred. Eventually, the emperor Nero rose to power, and at first he was a pretty level-headed, relatively well-liked ruler. But he fell victim to the things that people in power are often drawn to. More power, grandeur, pleasure, and obedience from others. This caused his approval ratings to drop significantly, and on June 8, 64 AD, a portion of Rome caught on fire. And it just so happened to be a plot of land that Nero was interested in building onto himself. And the fire quickly spread and caused a lot of damage. After the fire, some nasty rumors started to spread about whether it was actually Nero who started the fire. And the Roman historian Tacitus summarizes what happened next. In spite of every human effort of the emperor's largesse, of the sacrifices made to the gods, nothing sufficed to allay suspicion nor to destroy the opinion that the fire had been ordered. Therefore, in order to destroy this rumor, Nero blamed the Christians, who are hated for their abominations, and punished them with refined cruelty. Christ, of whom they take their name, was executed by Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius. Stop for a moment, the evil superstition reappeared, not only in Judea, where was the root of the evil, but also in Rome, where all things sordid and abominable from every corner of the world come together. Thus, first those who confessed were arrested, and on the basis of their testimony, a great number were condemned, although not so much for the fire itself as for their hatred of mankind. Many Roman citizens were suspicious of Christians. As the movement spread, the people began to make rumors about their religious practices and rituals. They claimed that they drank the blood and ate the flesh of children, that they married their brothers and sisters. And on top of that, the movement was destroying the Roman perception of the family. As people were becoming Christians, they were rejecting the gods of their fathers, and it caused a lot of drama, heartache, shame, and embarrassment for families. People saw their Christian neighbors, family, and friends as going astray. And it was this suspicion and disdain towards the movement and the blame shifting that Nero was playing with that fire that sparked a persecution in Rome that would lead to Paul losing his life. As the threat of persecution began to loom overhead, Paul, knowing his time was short, and that he was about to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, wrote these parting words to his successor, Timothy. I want you to hear them as the last words of a man to his successor. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing, and by his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, extort, with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Even as he was on his way to be beheaded by the sword of Rome, Paul, the man who had borne the sword of the Spirit during his entire life as a leader and minister of the church, encouraged the next generation of Christians to stand firm in the truth, to continue the work that he and the other apostles had started, to continue to grow the church by leading it well and anchoring it 
in the Bible. And as he closes this passage, he recognizes that he has done what all of us should do. He kept the faith. He finished the race. And he used his sword to fight the good and true fight for the kingdom. Now the word martyr doesn't just mean a person who dies for their faith. And in Greek it really means a person who's a witness or someone who testifies to something. And as Christians we are all martyrs in a way. We have seen and witnessed the saving power of Jesus in our lives. And we are called to testify about him to others. And I hope that as we've looked through Paul's story today and we've seen how radically different a person can be made by an encounter with Jesus and just how brave it can make them to face their death well, that all of this just makes you think and ponder. And to help you think, I have a few questions I want you to reflect on. First, what do you honestly think you would do if you were put in a situation where your faith in being a witness to Jesus would result in your death. This is one of the situations that so many people in the early church were confronted with, and many people in other parts of the world are confronted with now. Many of them stood firm, and others rejected Jesus to avoid death. And some seek to return to the church for forgiveness after that, but others didn't. And I would hope that I would stand firm, and I hope that I wouldn't be like Peter on the night Jesus was arrested, denying him to save my own skin. But I do know God is willing to forgive even Peter's denial. And because he genuinely repented, I think he would do the same for us. But what do you think he would actually do? Second, when Paul wrote those words down to Timothy and the second generation of Christians, that command trickled down the chain to us here in the 21st century. Do you think that we're living up to Paul's final words to the church? And what are some ways we could improve? Where are we falling short? What do you think? And finally, we often talk about life as a journey. At the end of Paul's life, he talks about his in a very similar way. He saw his life as a Christian as a race, and he was striving to be faithful and obedient to the very end, no matter what it looked like. So with that being said, where are you on that race right now? Are you running backwards? Are you just sitting on the sidelines? Are you struggling to keep up? Are you drifting off course? Or in more real terms, are you taking your faith seriously? Have you just let it get slack over the past year? Are you kind of running on autopilot? Or is it just more of a symbol or something cultural for you? Whatever the case is, what is one thing that you can do to get back on track and stay true to the end? And to close, I want to read a verse from Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, a cloud of martyrs, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so easily. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. This week and every week, think about Jesus. Think about what he did for you and for me. And think about how he stayed true to the very end and he bravely let himself be killed so that you and I could be saved and know God. And let that be the pep in your step as you run the next leg of the race, whatever it looks like. And before we go, I'm going to pray us out. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time we have to come together and to talk about something deep but beautiful. We thank you for so many men and women that have come before us who take their faith seriously and and they were taking it so seriously that they let it be the reason they were killed. As we go through this series, I ask that you touch our hearts with the stories of all these different men and women we'll be looking at. 
and that you let their stories challenge us, encourage us, and push us to take our faith as seriously as they did. Thank you for Paul and for his witness and how you used him to create so much of the New Testament that you speak to us through now. Thank you for his witness and his bravery, uh, bravery and for the legacy that he passed down to his disciples and that they have passed down all the way to us. And help us to take up our mantle, help us to take up the torch and to continue to bravely bear the name of Jesus, to follow you as we run the race and until we have the chance to pass the baton on to the next generation. Once again, we love you for everything you've done, and we thank you mostly for sending Jesus to come and die for us and to save us from our sins, to be the forerunner, to be the example, to show us how we ought to live. And with that being said, amen. All right, guys, thanks for coming to week one of Bloody Seeds. I'm excited about this one too. Uh, this has been something that's been on my heart for a while, and I think martyrdom is an important topic to talk about. And there are just so many amazing stories, and I'm really excited to share them with you over the next two weeks. But until we get back for next week, I will see you later, and I hope you have a great and blessed seven days. All right, bye. Tacitus, 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 the Roman historian, Tacitus, Tacitus. After the fire, some nasty rumors started to spread about whether or not Nero was the one who started it. And the Roman historian, Tac, uh, ugh.